All right, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for a presentation on ARPKD outside the kidneys, aneurysms, and liver disease. I'm Elise Hoover, and I'll be introducing our speaker in just a moment. So before we get started, all attendees will remain muted throughout the presentation to ensure good audio quality. Um, we are recording the webinar and we'll post the recording on our website within the next few days. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box located in your control panel on the right side of your screen. Next slide. This session is designed for informational purposes only, and it's not intended as advice on specific treatment or diagnosis of PKD. So as you listen, if it sparks questions for you regarding you or your child's disease journey, please speak with your doctor. Next slide. Our speaker tonight had no conflicts to disclose. Next slide. Okay, here are our learning objectives for tonight. Uh, you likely saw these when you registered for tonight's webinar. And then next slide. Great, so I'm excited to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Aram Hartung. Dr. Hartung is a pediatric nephrologist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania. Her clinical and research focus is in PKD, particularly autosomal recessive PKD. She co-directs the Combined Kidney and Liver Program, which specializes in the care of children with ARPKD and other genetic kidney or liver diseases and ciliopathies. Her research aims to accelerate the development of new treatments for ARPKD through observational and database studies to better define the natural history and complications of AR and through imaging studies to develop new biomarkers of kidney and liver disease progression. So welcome Dr. Hartung and we look forward to hearing about your work. All right, thank you, Elise. All right, I think you can see my slides, correct? Yes. All right, excellent. Put my point on. All right, so thank you all very much for, for joining this evening. Um, so uh, Elise already told you a little bit about my background. Um, I, that uh, combined kidney liver program, I, I co-direct with my colleague in uh, GI, Dr. Jessica Wen. Um, I also volunteer with the PKD Foundation on the Science Advisory Committee and the ARPKD Task Force. Um, and then these are my uh, research funding sources, the NIH, uh, the PKD Foundation, um, and the Ben Banks Jr. Uh, Foundation, which I'll tell you a little bit more about um, later. Um, so my goals for today are to review uh, just some basic information about PKD first, um, and then we'll talk about what we know about aneurysms and PKD um, and liver disease in, in ARPKD. Um, and then as I go along, I'll tell you about our ongoing research studies and how you can get involved. Um, so to review PKD, of course, you are all here because you're interested in hearing about autosomal recessive PKD, but I do, do just want to quickly uh, go over the two types of PKD, um, just because I think it's important to, to understand the similarities and differences between the two. So of course, AR is the less common type. It's about one in 20,000 people. Um, and as a recessive disease, it means that uh, the person will only have the disease if they inherit a mutation or a mistake in the gene from both of their parents. Um, so that's shown in this picture here where uh, each person is represented with their two genes um, and uh, the affected gene or the, the one that has a mutation in it is depicted in purple and the normal gene is depicted in this uh, teal color. Um, so you can see that when two people get together and have children, that um, there is a chance that one of their children will inherit uh, uh, one of the uh, mutations from each parent. And this happens randomly, so, so multiple siblings could uh, inherit this pattern. Um, and then others may be carriers or others may have inherited both normal copies. Um, in contrast, autosomal dominant PKD is much, much more common, about one in a thousand people. Um, and this is inherited uh, generally from one generation to the next because you only need one copy of the mutated gene in order to have the disease. Um, so just a quick review of the kidneys and what they do and, and how cysts form. So uh, of course, uh, the kidneys are located um, kind of towards the back of the abdomen, right, right tucked up uh, kind of beneath the ribs. Um, and if you zoom into the kidneys, each kidney has about a million of these tiny filters, which is kind of zoomed up here. Um, and consisting of a, a, a filtering unit called the glomerulus and then a series of tubes 
where the urine as it's made uh, flows through and then collects down um, so that the urine that is made collects here centrally and then uh, drains away through the bladder. So what is a cyst? So a cyst really, you can think of it like a water balloon. So a cyst will form and grow, for, in order for a cyst to form and grow, you have to have two things going on. So first the walls of that cyst need to uh, be able to multiply and grow. And then there needs to be some sort of fluid that fills the cyst. Um, so in PKD, that looks like uh, uh, in one of two ways. So in ADPKD, you have these large bubble-like cysts that are throughout the kidney. Whereas in ARPKD, which is what we're focusing on today, there are these tiny, tiny, tiny tubular cysts, which often may not be even visible on an ultrasound and, and just overall make the kidney look irregular. Um, in terms of what that looks like in those uh, filtering units that I showed you before, so this is one of those uh, nephrons that I showed you. A normal one is shown here on the left. And in PKD, in ADPKD, you have these uh, bubble-like outpouchings coming out of these tubules. Whereas in ARPKD, you have um, the cysts forming really in this um, end part of the tubule where it, the tubule itself is getting stretched out. Um, but in both cases, you can see that whatever is happening with PKD makes these tubular structures kind of unable to maintain their normal tubular shape. Um, and that becomes important as we'll uh, see and we talk uh, a little bit about aneurysms. Um, so the other big difference between ADPKD and ARPKD is what happens outside the kidney. So of course, today we're talking about liver disease in ARPKD, and we're also gonna be talking about aneurysms. Um, but you'll see that um, in ADPKD, that's really where uh, we know most about aneurysms. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we know so far about aneurysms in ARPKD. Uh, so the key point is that even though AD and ARPKD are different diseases caused by different genes, um, there is a lot of biological overlap um, that um, makes it so that we can really learn from discoveries um, in both realms. And so, um, and so that's why we look closely at, at some of the research that's done in ADPKD to try to inform us about ARPKD. Um, so uh, this brings us to our first polling question. So, uh, and I think uh, Elise is gonna put this question in our, uh, up on your screen so you can select the answer. Um, so before this webinar, before you heard about this webinar, were you aware of any links between brain aneurysms and PKD? Um, and you can choose no, uh, you can choose yes if, it's, if you'd only heard about it in ADPKD, and yes if you heard about it in both AD and ARPKD. Um, so we'll give everyone a few seconds to uh, click a response, and then um, Elise can tell us uh, a summary of what uh, people responded. All right, I don't think I can see the poll results. Elise, are you able to tell us how people responded? I cannot see it on my end. Melanie, would you mind sharing? Sure, no problem. So 57% said yes, um, but only in ADPKD, and 43% said yes in both ADPKD and ARPKD. Okay, all right, and nobody had, had not heard of the link before. Okay, all right. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about aneurysm. So an aneurysm is a bulge or a ballooning out in a blood vessel or artery. Um, and that can look either like a, uh, so if this is an artery here, it can look either like a bubble like outpouching from the artery, or it can be kind of the artery itself being bulged out. Um, and you can see, you know, this reminds us a little bit about what the tubules look like in, in ADPKD. And you can imagine that, um, that anything that where you have a problem with maintaining kind of the integrity of a tubular structure, that maybe there is some similarity um, with what's happening in the blood vessels. Um, aneurysms in general can happen anywhere in any artery in the body, but what we're uh, really uh, most concerned about is when they happen in the brain, and that's what's uh, as shown in this cartoon at the bottom here. Um, and they can happen in people with no genetic risk factors. Um, so people say, for example, um, with high blood pressure for other reasons or from smoking, um, or they can happen in association with various genetic disorders, including ADPKD. 
Um, in general, brain aneurysms uh, tend not to have any symptoms unless the aneurysm bursts or ruptures. Or ruptures. Um, an intact aneurysm can sometimes cause symptoms if it's large enough and in a, uh, in a place where it's pressing on something where it could cause headaches or visual changes. Um, but otherwise, um, unfortunately, most people don't necessarily know they have one um, until the aneurysm ruptures um, or, or if it's been found on imaging. Um, so the symptoms of a ruptured aneurysm, um, and this is really a life-threatening emergency, it can be a sudden severe headache. People um, may describe it as the worst headache of their life, um, or a thunderclap headache would often relate it to how quickly it comes on. Um, and then if uh, it progresses, it can uh, also cause loss of consciousness, vomiting, neck pain, or stiffness. Um, aneurysms can be treated, and that can be either, um, you know, if it's found on screening, um, uh, or even after it bleeds, they can be treated by uh, either surgical clipping, where you just kind of uh, cut off the circulation, um, or with a, a catheter-directed procedure where uh, the interventional radiology doctors can go in through an artery and, and put substance into the um, aneurysm to make it clot off. Um, so in terms of uh, the link with PKD, we know that Adults with autosomal dominant PKD, so not AR PKD, but an AD PKD, um, there is a fourfold higher risk of brain aneurysms compared to the general population. Um, and that risk is higher among people who in their, in their family members with PKD if previous generations had aneurysms as well. Um, so overall in the general adult population, the prevalence of brain aneurysms is about between, is between two and 4%, um, or two to 3%, I should say. Um, whereas an ADPKD, that prevalence is somewhere between 8 and 12 percent. Um, and so again, it seems like there's something about PKD, or at least ADPKD, that directly affects the health and strength of blood vessels and them being able to maintain their no normal tubular shape. Um, and so because of this known link, there are recommendations about screening for uh, brain aneurysms in people who have ADPKD, but depending on various criteria. So what do we know about um, whether there's a risk of brain aneurysms in ARPPD? Um, so there have been rare cases of aneurysms that have been reported in children and young adults with ARPKD. Um, and at least what's in the medical literature is there have been a total of seven patients with brain aneurysms who've been reported over the last 25 years. Um, they ranged in age from uh, two and a half to 31 years. Um, sadly, two of those individuals uh, passed away. Um, and then others were being monitored closely or were treated with clipping or coiling. Um, there's also been reports of two other patients who had aneurysms in other parts of the body. Um, so the questions that, that we had, and, and that's what led to this research, is how common are brain aneurysms in people with ARPKD? And does ARPKD directly affect the health and strength of blood vessels in the same way that it does that ARAD PKD? Um, so before I tell you a little bit more about uh, the research, I want to tell you about this amazing uh, little boy, Ben Banks. Um, I never had the privilege of meeting Ben, um, but uh, his family contacted me um, sometime after he passed away. He uh, had ARPKD um, and uh, had a ruptured brain aneurysm and unfortunately uh, lost uh, his battle. Um, and his parents, Ben and Marie, um, they reached out and, and actually through the PKD Foundation, I think it was Elise who connected us, um, and they really wanted uh, to make, uh, uh, to really bring some uh, meaning to Ben's legacy and, and help other families. Um, and so it was really their idea to, to try to um, increase awareness of this and, and research. And they uh, uh, started this foundation, the Ben Banks uh, Junior Memorial Foundation, that provided. Um, initial funding for this project. And then I was able to uh, kind of expand the project and, and apply for some funding through the PKD Foundation, and that's what uh, led the study to get started. Um, so in this study, um, we have uh, several questions. Um, and so uh, first is really how common are brain aneurysms in people with ARPKD? Um, so to try to answer that, we will be doing um, MRI of the arteries in the brain. Um, but then beyond that, we want to try to answer that question about the, the health and strength of the blood vessels. So we're going to look at blood vessels um, in the heart and other areas. 
Um, so we'll look at um, echocardiogram um, and other risk factors that could affect the health and strength of the blood vessels. So we'll look at 24-hour uh, blood pressure monitors, uh, various tests of blood vessel function, which I'll tell you um, in a little bit more detail in a minute, um, and some blood tests that look at blood vessel health and inflammation. Um, so that brings us to our second poll, um, which is on the screen now. So I'm uh, curious um, if you or your child have participated in a clinical research study before. Um, and by that, I mean any sort of research involving data collection, testing, or procedures, even if, even if you're not necessarily uh, uh, in a drug study. Great. We have almost half have already voted. Oh, wow. People are quick. Okay. Yeah. All right, it looks like we have about 60% who said yes. Okay, all right, great. All right, um, so um, this study, um, in terms of who can participate, what we are aiming to do is recruit 15 individuals with ARPKD, um, age six and up, mainly because uh, six is really the very youngest that we think someone could do an MRI and uh, lie still enough to do the MRI. Um, there is no upper age limit, so if you or uh, are an adult with ARPKD or you have an adult uh, child with ARPKD, you're welcome to participate. Um, uh, we do ask that there are no uh, heart conditions that are independent of ARPKD, so if there's some unrelated disorder. Um, and in this study, it is okay if, uh, if the individual has had a kidney and or liver transplant or if they're currently on dialysis. Um, we'll also be recruiting age-matched healthy individuals for comparison. Um, there are some exclusions that if, uh, if someone has an active infection, if they're using uh, tobacco or um, other drugs, certain medications, uh, pregnancy, um, or if they're just not able to do MRI due to claustrophobia or other reasons or uh, certain metals in the body, um, then we would not be able to have you participate. Um, what's involved is a single study visit to uh, CHOP, CHOP in Philadelphia, um, lasting about four to five hours, um, plus a 24-hour blood pressure monitor that we provide that you take home. Um, so what the day would look like, and this is um, you know, an approximation, but we do require um, an overnight fast at home. So generally, uh, um, so you would have uh, you know, maybe a late night snack and then go to bed, have nothing to eat um, until the morning. Um, and then we try to schedule the visits um, early in the morning, generally around 7 a.m. Um, you go first to the nursing center where there's some physical measurements, um, a blood draw, um, as well as an optional urine test. Um, and then uh, you head over to the cardiovascular lab where there's a number of blood vessel tests. These are all non-invasive tests. There's no needles or anything. Um, there is a test called carotid intimal medial thickness, which is essentially an ultrasound of the carotid arteries to look for um, essentially the thickness of the carotid arteries and, and any signs of plaques or anything like that. Um, something called pulse wave velocity analysis, which is um, a way to measure the stiffness of arteries. So that involves uh, some probes being placed uh, on the neck and on the, um, the leg, as well as the blood pressure cuff on the leg. Um, and then this device called endopat, which measures blood flow in the arms. And again, that involves having a blood pressure cuff on the arm, being inflated for some time, and then there's sensors on the fingers to measure how the blood flows back into the uh, fingers after the blood pressure cuff is released. Um, and then those are the only studies that need to be done fasting, so we uh, make sure that we give uh, time for a snack break, but hopefully people will be able to eat by uh, mid-morning or so. Um, and then uh, you stay in the cardiovascular lab for the echocardiogram, which I'm sure uh, many of you have probably uh, been through that already, which is uh, just an ultrasound of the heart. Um, and then the MRI scan um, of the brain takes about 30 minutes or so. Um, uh, you do need to be able to lie quite still for that, which generally, um, you know, a six-year-old who's, who's mature and able to follow instructions uh, may be able to do this. Um, so, you, you know, that's something that we can, uh, uh, we have a questionnaire that we can go through and, and get a sense of whether your child uh, might be able to do this. Um, it is possible to listen to music or watch a movie during the scan, um, and there's no contrast or sedation given. Um, and then at some point during the day, we also give you uh, an ambulatory blood pressure monitor um, with instructions for how to do that. Some of you may have already done that as part of your clinical care. 
Um, and that's something you take with you, take home with you, wear it continuously for 24 hours, and we provide a prepaid box to return it. Um, and then aside from this, there, you know, at some point during the day, our coordinators have some uh, medical history questions um, uh, to go over. Um, so for this study, um, in terms of risks, there are not really any physical risks, just mainly any discomfort that could be related to fasting or the blood draw or uh, the other procedures like the pressure from the blood pressure cuff, et cetera. Um, but mainly it would just be whether the person uh, might get anxious during MRI. Um, again, if, um, if they're not able to, you know, we can give it a try. And if they're not able to, then, then of course we can always stop. Um, no real direct benefits to the uh, to you, to the participant directly, but we, uh, but of course, we're, um, you would be helping us to learn about ARPKD. Um, in terms of compensation, we offer um, uh, $80 for ju just the time, effort, and convenience. We do uh, provide lunch vouchers for the participant and the um, parent or guardian. Um, reimbursement of actual uh, driving costs based on just the IRA mileage rate or public transportation costs. Um, and if you live too far away to be able to do this, you know, to kind of drive to CHOP, um, do the study visit and drive home in the same day, um, then we do have a stipend to offset the cost of a hotel. Um, or if you prefer to fly in, we have a stipend to, to try to offset the, um, uh, the airfare as well. Um, so if you're interested in participating in the study, I have this is a copy of our flyer, which I can uh, provide to um, Elise if anyone wants an email copy of this. Um, but this is the email address to reach uh, my study team. Um, so it's ARPKD underscore studies at chop.edu. Um, or there's this QR code, which if you just um, you know want to pull up, you can even try it now if you like. I did test this and it works. Um, but if you pull up the, the uh, phone on your camera and, and point it at the screen, um, uh, it should give you a link to our little intake form where you can just fill out some basic contact info and our team can get in touch with you. And I'll display these again at the end. All right, so then uh, let's move on to liver disease. Um, so to just go over some basics about the liver. Um, so the liver is located um, in the right upper part of the abdomen. Um, the, the main function of the liver is really to aid with uh, digesting our food and, uh, and metabolizing everything um, and, uh, and turning our food into the building blocks of our body. So the way uh, that this works is that the liver produces uh, bile um, to, that helps us to digest food. That bile flows through these small uh, kind of bile ducts within the liver and then that all collects to this larger uh, bile duct that connects to the intestines. The, the gallbladder collects that bile. Um, and then the other way that the liver works is it has to absorb, um, take in everything that comes through the intestine. So there are, so from the intestines, stomach and spleen, there's a blood flow system that basically passes everything from that internal cir circulation goes through the liver uh, before it's returned to the rest of the body. Um, so with uh, ARPKD related liver disease, there can be three main issues. Uh, first is bile duct dilation. So the bile ducts that I showed you inside the liver, um, those can be enlarged. Not everybody will have this, but, uh, but it is something that, uh, that some people can have. Um, congenital hepatic fibrosis, or you may have seen uh, the term CHF or uh, uh, ARPKD slash CHF. That refers to the liver itself becoming scarred and stiff. Um, and as that progresses, that can develop into something called portal hypertension. And so when the liver becomes very stiff, um, then that blood flow that I told you about that comes from those internal organs um, in, through the liver, that that blood flow can't happen properly. And so you get high blood pressure in that portal system. Um, and I'll show you a picture of, of uh, a cartoon of what that uh, can lead to. Um, the key thing to know is just like the kidney disease, the, the, the liver disease in ARPKD is very variable. So some people have no symptoms at all and never develop any symptoms, um, and some people can have more severe disease. Um, and there's also no clear relationship between the severity of kidney and liver disease. There can be people who have very severe of one and, and very mild of the other, or very severe in both, or very mild in both. And, and there, aren't, uh, there aren't very, very clear uh, understanding of why that happens. 
Um, so in terms of what those uh, issues look like, um, so um, as I told you, the liver, so on the right side of this picture, they're showing um, just what a normal biliary tree may look like. Um, and what's happening in ARPKD is, again, that same concept of just, you know, tubular structures not being able to stay normally tubular. So they develop these kind of bulges and dilations. Um, and so that uh, leads to um, these dilations of the bile ducts um, inside the liver. Um, and then the portal hypertension happens when um, the liver is very stiff and that blood flow that I was uh, telling you about that comes from the spleen, comes from the stomach is not shown here, but if this is a, the esophagus or the stomach um, and from the intestines, that that blood flow that's normally supposed to flow up through the liver um, can't uh, do that properly. And so it kind of backs up. And then that can lead to um, these veins basically becoming stretched out and dilated and leading to something called varices in the esophagus, which are just dilated veins, um, and uh, to a backup of blood in the spleen so that the spleen itself becomes enlarged. And when the spleen gets enlarged, um, because one of the spleen's jobs is to kind of clean up old blood cells, the spleen kind of starts to do too much of that. Um, and it starts to kind of um, trap things like platelets and white blood cells um, that are part of our normal blood cells that circulate, and so those levels can get low. Um, and so in terms of symptoms, um, as I said, it's a huge spectrum. Um, some people may have no symptoms. So uh, in terms of the bile duct dilatation, they may have completely normal appearing bile ducts on ultrasound. The liver itself may look normal, and they may really have nothing detectable. Um, uh, the other thing I should mention, actually, is that um, I have this depicted as kind of mild, moderate, severe, but these things, the bile duct dilation, not everybody has, um, and, and the bile duct, dil the severity of the bile duct dilation doesn't always go with the severity of the fibrosis and portal hypertension. Um, but in terms of the bile duct disease, some people will just have some visibly dilated ducts, but never have any symptoms or problems from it. Um, the main thing that we do get concerned about with the bile ducts is uh, they can sometimes get infected. That's a condition called ascending cholangitis. Um, and in some people that can happen over and over again um, and cause more uh, problems with recurrent infection. Um, the fibrosis in terms of what's happening in the liver itself, probably the earliest sign could be just on regular ultrasound, you can see that liver appearing uh, somewhat irregular. Um, it can get enlarged and then as um, as I mentioned, as that liver gets stiffer, um, then the portal hypertension can develop. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned before, the spleen starts to get enlarged, and then as that spleen enlarges, it can uh, start to trap those blood uh, cells, like platelets and white blood cells. Um, and so, what you start to see in early diseases, you might have slightly low platelet counts, um, but then people with more severe disease may have uh, lower platelet counts and eventually also develop uh, lower white blood cell counts. Uh, the varices, the dilated veins in the esophagus, they can be there and not cause any problems, but of course what we worry about is whether they may bleed. Um, and some people that bleeding can happen uh, over and over and, and require procedures um, such as endoscopy to, uh, uh, to kind of band them or, or um, uh, like inject them uh, with a material to kind of make them wither away. Um, some people, um, even with uh, treatments that, like medical treatments, they still have a lot of problems with, say, recurrent bleeding or maybe recurrent uh, bile duct infections. Um, and so if it's a matter of having recurrent uh, bleeding from varices, one option that people sometimes need is something called shunt surgery, which essentially diverts that blood flow away from the liver. So instead of, so all that blood flow from the intestines and spleen can go directly into the regular circulation instead of having to pass through the liver. Um, and in, if you look in the literature, there's a wide, wide range for how, what proportion of people uh, need this among people who have ARPKD, anywhere from 10 to 40% of people. Um, and then liver transplant is needed probably in about 10% of people, um, and sometimes depending on the relationship between the severity of liver and kidney disease, uh, sometimes that may be a combined transplant. Um, and so um, what, is, uh, what are some of the issues related to um, liver disease? So um, one thing, one problem that we have both in clinical and um, research context is that 
we don't have great ways of knowing what's happening in the liver until the disease has gotten more advanced. So until you're starting to develop that portal hypertension, maybe the spleen is starting to enlarge or the platelets uh, are starting to fall. Um, and, and we don't really have good ways of figuring out if that disease is getting worse at earlier stages. Um, and, and really, so our goal is to see if we might be able to develop new ways of measuring liver disease severity. Um, so essentially, uh, the term that we use in medicine is biomarkers, which is essentially a term for any sort of measurement that is telling you something about what's happening in the body. Um, and and uh, that would be something that would be useful for both clinical monitoring um, as well as drug development. Um, so um, to focus on how this helps drug development, um, I just want to say, uh, say a few words quickly about the process of drug development and where something like a biomarker fits into uh, to that process. Um, and so in order for a drug to be developed, you have to have some sort of scientific basis of um, usually over years and decades of lab-based work where you might be uh, coming up with candidate drugs in uh, different kind of cell culture models or in animals. Um, and that gives you the initial um, uh, hypothesis that something might work for a disease. Um, then you would have a phase one study, which is essentially a study in a small number of people really doing things like uh, testing safety, testing dosing, looking at how the, uh, the drug is metabolized, et cetera. Um, if that all goes well, then there's uh, phase two and three studies are where you start to look at, uh, you continue to look at safety, but then you're starting to get more information about um, whether the drug works. Um, and then if that all is successful, then, uh, then that can lead to FDA approval. Um, and then of course, after a drug is on the market, the FDA does continue to look out for, uh, for um, ongoing problems or effects. Um, so in ARPKD, where we stand is that, um, you know, in the lab-based phase, there's actually a number of drugs that have looked really exciting and promising um, in, in animal models. Um, um, but in terms of getting past that, we have not been able to get very far yet. Um, so there's been only one drug that has completed a phase one clinical trial in a small number of children with ARPKD. Um, but we have not had any phase two or three clinical trials uh, launched in ARPKD yet. Um, so why is that, that, that we have not yet been able to, to move to that stage? Um, so there's a number of issues. Um, so just to kind of talk about how a, a phase two or three clinical trial might, uh, would work, is that in general, you have to have, of course, a, a group of eligible participants, which for ARPKD being a rare disease, even uh, finding enough people to be in a, a clinical trial can be challenging. Um, but in general, the way most trials work is that there's often uh, the investigational drug um, and, uh, and a placebo, and people are randomly assigned to take one or the other. Um, and then there has to be some sort of period of monitoring where, you're, where that person is taking the drug for some period of time, usually something on the order of one to four years, and then there has to be some sort of uh, you know, test or something that you're measuring during that time to be able to tell whether the drug is working so that at the end you have a sense of you know, whether your drug did better than the placebo. And so where biomarkers fit into all of this is really in this disease progression stage. So, um, so if we don't have good ways of measuring if the disease is getting worse, uh, particularly at early stages where you know, someone might have the potential to benefit the most from a drug, um, if we don't have good ways of measuring whether things are changing, then we're never going to be able to tell if a drug works or not. Um, so that's really what we've been working on. And so we've been uh, trying to use imaging methods. Um, so we've had an ongoing study at CHOP for a number of years now where we have used um, ultrasound and MRI to, um, to measure kidney and liver disease progression in children with ARPKD. Um, and so focusing on uh, the liver disease, we have been looking at uh, different ways to measure liver and spleen stiffness, which, um, which essentially corresponds to that fibrosis or scarring um, and, uh, and possibly to the portal hypertension as well. Um, so the way we did the study is we compared children uh, with ARPKD to healthy children. Um, and then we also looked within the, the children who had ARPKD, whether we were able to tell differences between children who had more severe liver-related <clears throat> symptoms compared to those who don't. 
Um, and then we've continued to follow these children yearly to see how these uh, measures change over time. Um, so to just show you um, sort of what we found in that study so far, um, this, um, uh, this is just a depiction of that ultrasound method of measuring stiffness. So this is done with a standard ultrasound, I mean, a specialized but standard ultrasound machine where along with being able to get pictures as you would for a normal ultrasound, it's able to take these stiffness measures by measuring how fast a wave uh, follows, uh, travels through that organ. Um, and we, we hypothesize that, uh, that that stiffness would be higher in people who had uh, fibrosis and portal hypertension. Um, and and indeed, that's what we found. So I know these graphs are kind of complicated, but the but the bottom line is that um, the the stiffness measures uh, were higher in the liver, uh, both sides of the liver. We looked at left and right separately, um, and the spleen. And that overall, the readings in people who had ARPKD were higher in each of those three locations compared to healthy children. Um, and then when we looked at within the people who have ARPKD, uh, folks who had signs of portal hypertension, so meaning they their, maybe their spleen was large or they had high platelet, uh, low platelet counts, um, that people with signs of liver disease did have higher stiffness measures. So at least as a, a proof of principle, um, this way of measuring organ stiffness seems to be um, helpful in people who have ARPKD. Um, and then similarly, MR elastography is again looking at stiffness, this time by putting um, uh, um, a vibrating device on the belly that essentially this uh, kind of gives a schematic of that, that there's a vibrating device that kind of passes these waves through the liver and the MRI is able to take those waves and turn them into a, a picture that tells you about how stiff the liver, uh, how stiff the liver is, that's, that's here on the, uh, the patient's right side, um, and the spleen. Um, and so these are results from our study. So, um, so again, we found that uh, children with ARPKD had higher liver stiffness than healthy children. Um, and so this is just an example of some pictures of folks who were in our study that um, on these pictures of, of more orange or red means, uh, stiff, means stiffer. Um, and so you can see just visually the differences between how stiff the healthy liver is compared to someone who has ARPKD but they don't have portal hypertension compared to someone who, um, who has ARPKD and portal hypertension. And then this on the left side of the patient is the spleen. Um, and so this is just uh, really, again, a, a proof of concept that, um, that this is something that we can measure based on imaging. Um, and so in terms of the ongoing study, um, so you know the, what we found so far um, is that that stiffness seems to correlate um, with liver disease. We know that the stiffness is probably primarily related to the fibrosis um, part of liver disease, but as I mentioned before, there's really three parts of ARPKD liver disease. Um, and we really thought that it's important to be able to look at all three parts. So, uh, so the study that I'm about to tell you about um, looks both at the bile duct dilatation and gives us more information about the portal hypertension as well. Um, and so what we're doing in this study is looking at two new MRI sequences that we're hoping will be able to tell us about all three aspects of liver disease. Um, so that MR elastography is, um, is the same uh, technology that we used in the previous study, but this time we're gonna be using uh, basically a newfangled version of it that's called 3D um, MR elastography. Um, that gives a number of different physical measurements uh, uh, about the properties of the liver. So not just stiffness, but other ways in which uh, the, the texture um, and, um, of the liver is affected. And that can give us more information about both fibrosis and portal hypertension. Um, and then the other technology is something called quantitative MRCT or MRCT plus. Um, which gives these very beautiful pictures of the bile ducts inside the liver. But what's very um, uh, um, informative about it is that you can actually put some numbers behind the picture. Um, so there's um, specialized computer software where it can actually tell us things like uh, the total volume of the biliary tree uh, or how many dilations there are. And these are just examples of, of some patients who have had this uh, scan before. So this is an example of a healthy patient where maybe their biliary volume is relatively low. 
uh, where someone with ARPKD and mild bile duct disease, they may have uh, a higher uh, volume of that uh, of those bile ducts, and then somebody with more severely dilated bile ducts has a much higher volume. And this gives you just some sense of how this could be useful um, to, to measure something that previously was only uh, um, able to be seen visually but not quantified. Um, so in this study, we are looking to recruit um, 10 individuals with ARPKD. Again, our lower age limit is six, just in terms of uh, being able to tolerate the MRI. Um, again, there's no upper age limit. Um, because we do uh, want to look at the, the native liver of ARPKD, of course, uh, we can't have uh, people who've had a liver transplant, um, but uh, having a kidney transplant is fine. Um, and again, we're going to be uh, recruiting age-matched healthy individuals for comparison. Um, and the only main uh, uh, exclusion criteria here are, are pregnancy or, or inability to do MRI. Um, this is also a single uh, study visit to CHOP, and this one's shorter, only about two hours or so. Um, and, if, um, and if you're eligible for both studies, we, we do welcome people to participate in both, and we can arrange uh, to have both studies either done uh, on the same day or on uh, kind of back-to-back -back days. Um, or even completely separate days, whatever whatever is most uh, convenient for you. Um, so what this study looks like um, is there is a fasting, but this is shorter, um, only four hours. So that could be either overnight or, for example, uh, you could have lunch, and then if the MRI is, is scheduled for late in the day, then you just wouldn't have anything to eat between lunch and when the MRI happens uh, towards the end of the day. Um, there's a visit to the nursing center again for some physical measurements and a blood draw, um, and then the MRI scanner. Um, so this, uh, so the way that this, uh, uh, the way the scan would look is that there's this vibrating device um, that's made of like uh, fabric covered plastic. Um, it's uh, put onto the belly, and then these uh, the the imaging coils are put on over it to kind of strap it into place. Um, and at intervals during the scan, you feel it um, kind of vibrate. It's not painful or anything. It just kind of feels like a buzzing. Um, and, uh, and this scan lasts about 30 minutes. Um, again, need to be able to lie still. There's no contrast or sedation. Um, and again, uh, should be able to listen to music or watch a movie during the scan. Um, again, no real physical risks from uh, the study other than uh, possible discomfort related to the fasting or blood draw or uh, feeling anxious from the MRI. Um, and the compensation for this study is uh, $40 for time and inconvenience, uh, lunch vouchers, and then again, reimbursement of transportation or, um, uh, or stipend for hotel or airfare if needed. Um, and so again, the, the, it's the same email address that reaches my study team. This is a, a different QR code uh, than the, before if you wanted to uh, uh, do the intake form, but the intake forms go to the same, to my team. So uh, either way, you can, even if you fill out one of them, uh, uh, it will get to the right place. Um, uh, so this brings us to our final poll question. So uh, uh, just gauging what people's level of interest is in research in the future. And this is just general interest in any research, not necessarily uh, these particular studies. Great. 40%. Uh, wait, I'm, on my preview screen, I'm seeing the previous poll question. That's, is that what everyone's seeing? The one where it says, where we asked whether they've done research before? Uh, I'm seeing your level of participating in the future. Oh, okay. All right. And so, sorry, what was that? Let's see. I think we stopped the vote a little early. Uh, it was 46% yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, so really the uh, take home points are that, um, you know, in both studies, we're trying to learn about different uh, complications outside the kidney for ARPKD. Um, uh, so please do reach out um, if you're interested in participating or if you just want some more detailed information. We have uh, uh, the consent forms that you can review if you want, um, you know, a better idea of um, just more details about the procedures. Um, this email address uh, connects to my study team, um, and these are those QR codes again if you wanted to, um, to fill out our, our simple intake form.
Um, so finally, I want to thank all of you for being here uh, this evening. I uh, want to thank my patients, families, and, and people who've been in the research studies before. Um, my funding sources, the NIH, uh, PKD Foundation, and of course the Banks family. Um, my collaborators, both in the clinical realm and uh, my research collaborators, both at CHOP um, and at Case Western. Um, and this is my study team, Mohini and Catherine. So these are the, or Kate, these, these are the folks who would be on the receiving end of your uh, email um, uh, and, uh, and would be happy to, to chat with you if you wanna learn about the study further or, or I'd be happy to chat with you as well. Uh, so that's the end of my uh, prepared remarks. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Hartung, that was fantastic. Um, we already have some questions coming in, but a reminder to go ahead and put those in the question or chat box and we can go ahead and ask them now. Um, I'll get started. So could you remind us, do you need to live in Philadelphia to participate in these studies? No, no. So you, um, uh, as I mentioned, there is, we do try to offset travel costs a little bit. You know, our funding doesn't allow us to completely 100% reimburse like any uh, you know, airfare, but, um, but we do provide like say if you needed to, to fly in, we provide $250 for the participant and $250 for a parent or guardian uh, to account for the airfare, um, and then $250 to, to account for the hotel. Um, so, and, and we do have that amount of money for each study. So if you end up coming into town for, uh, and, and participating in both studies, then we could give you that reimbursement from both studies. Um, uh, but yeah, you're certainly really from anyone, anyone who's willing to travel to Philadelphia, you're uh, welcome to, uh, to participate. Fantastic. Um, and is genetic testing included as a part of either of these studies? Um, it is not as part of our study directly. Um, however, I do collaborate very closely with um, a colleague in genetics, Dr. Strong, um, and she is part of a larger uh, genetic testing uh, um, uh, research study where um, where we've actually arranged that if we have patients that are interested in also contributing uh, uh, to genetic testing that they're welcome to kind of enroll at the same time in their study and all that's involved there is signing a consent form and giving a blood sample. Um, so that's one option. The other is that the blood that we do collect um, as part of the study um, we are there is the option for for allowing us to store that for future research. Um, as of right now, we don't have the, the funding necessarily to be able to do the genetic testing right away, but it is something that could be um, added on in the future. Okay. And as far as the other results of the study procedures, um, can parents get those results uh, from the kids' study visit? Um, yeah, so, so in terms of both studies, there are parts of the study where we're doing uh, testing that it's essentially considered standard of care, so things like you know, regular blood tests like um, say a CBC or a metabolic panel. Um, and those are done in our hospital lab. Um, and those are results that of course you would be able to, uh, to get copies of. Um, and similar in the aneurysm study, say the echocardiogram, the 24 hour blood pressure monitor, anything that's considered a standard clinical test um, can be provided to you. Um, some of the other measures that we're doing because they're more investigational. So say, you know, the fancy new, uh, bile duct measurements or the, the, the other measurements, because they're considered investigational, that's not really something that, that we can release, but, um, but anything that is uh, a clinically um, uh, relevant imaging finding um, would be disclosed to you. So say if they saw something unexpected on a scan, then of course uh, a radiologist does look at all these scans um, just to, as a safety check. So if something unexpected were found, or of course if, uh, you know, if an aneurysm was found, then of course, uh, let you know anything that would affect your clinical care. Okay. And are you aware of any research opportunities for someone with a child younger than six? Uh, for ARPKD specifically, um, there's uh, there is a database study which is uh, run by Dr. Uh, Lisa Gay Woodford. Um, so some people may have already uh, participated in that. That's a um, that study doesn't involve any study visits. It's basically um, allowing your child's um, medical information to be put into the database so that we can, and then there is the option of uh, doing a, a, a DNA sample as well. Um, um, our other study where uh, we were doing the ultrasound that was open to children younger than six as well, but we've pretty much um, 
kind of wrapped up enrollment and we're just finishing uh, kind of ongoing uh, uh, follow-up for those uh, people. So as of right now, um, I'm not aware of any uh, studies for, for people younger than six. Okay. And if anyone is interested in hearing about Lisa Gay Woodford's study, um, feel free to email research at pkdcure.org and we can go ahead and send you information about that. Okay. And is there anything else, Dr. Hartung, that you think a, pa a parent should know when they're thinking about signing up their child for a study? Um, I mean, I do think it's important to um, uh, for the kid to have a um, buy-in. I mean, we're required to to get what's called assent from a child, so a child has to affirmatively say that they are willing to do it. Um, I think, um, you know, for the most part, though, I think, you know, of the of the people who've participated, um, uh, you know, the kids have really done great and have been, um, you know, very um, happy with with being in the study. Um, but I think really, um, you know, I know, of course, for ARPKD, we are um, so uh, focused on the goal of being able to get a treatment and being able to get a drug that can delay progression. And of course, we um, that is some years out. But I think just remembering that even though studies like this don't seem as exciting or maybe, you know, it's, it's not the same as being in, say, a clinical trial, they are really important building blocks to being able to get to that uh, that dream of having a, a, a treatment that can delay progression. Um, so yeah, I think that's, um, and, and actually certainly if I know many of, since many of you said that you have participated in, in research, I would love if you have anything to, to add to that in the chat, anything that you learned from your prior participation that you think others should know, that would be great if you could put it in the chat. Absolutely. Okay, you have another question. You mentioned that you're looking for some children who are not impacted by AR to participate in the studies. Um, would that include a sibling of a child with ARPKD? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, no, so we actually deliberately have uh, excluded siblings from being able to participate just because um, we don't know for sure that whether being a carrier, so a sibling, you know, they could either be a carrier or they could not have the ARPKD mutation at all. Um, and what we don't really know is say, um, you know, if someone is a carrier, whether that could affect any of the, the results that we're looking for. And so what we are looking for really would be somebody who's um, unrelated, but, but similar in age. Okay, and another one, what about a sibling of a child with a spontaneous mutation where parents are not carriers? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, so for ARPKD, um, I mean, if someone has that scenario, I'd be very interested to hear actually, because spontaneous mutation would mean that you'd have to have spontaneous mutation in both genes, which would be super rare, um, but I guess it could happen. But yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, certainly if you, if you have questions, feel free to reach out and we can look at any um, individual scenario um, in more detail. Okay. Great, that's all the questions. Um, we also have some thank yous in the chat. So thank you, Dr. Hartung. Um, as a yeah, reminder to everyone, you. of course, as a reminder to everyone, um, this is being recorded, so it'll be available on our website. And um, yeah, on behalf of everyone at the foundation, thanks, Dr. Hartung, and thanks everyone for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.